representation uh, amongst theatre practitioners, theatre makers, theatre community. We come together every Thursday to discuss the unrehearsed future. And uh, and so and and as you can see, everyone's friendly faces. They're all waving to each other in Zoom and happy to see each other. That's so great. Um, today, uh, I am joined uh, with by Shankar Venkateshwaran. Uh, he is the artistic director and founder of Theatre Roots and Wings. Um, Falguni will post his bio in there to read it, and I will give you a more anecdotal notion of na nature of his bio and things that actually stood out to me in terms of the context of this conversation that we're about to have. Um, when I first uh, came back to India in 2008, um, I didn't know what to do. Uh, and we started, and I first thought about professionalizing sort of theater training by just starting these one week long workshops and making sure somebody trained uh, could come in and teach. And I would find the best people I could find from across the country and bring them to Bombay and offer this to the community. And it was a notion, people said it would never work. Uh, and when I reached out to Shankar, through a random introduction, I think it was Anmul Bilani of the IFA, uh, India Foundation for the Arts at the time. Uh, Shankar just said, yes, sure, absolutely. And it was this sort of common joint sort of desire for a rigor and practice and a commitment to, to theatrical practice that sort of joined us. But he supported uh, the work coming in, uh, conducting workshops. And that's when I found out about his training at what was then called TTRP in Singapore, which is a, a, a center for intercultural theater practice. Now it's called the Intercultural Training in Theater Institute. Uh, it was rebranded, um, but basically they were looking at, which I found really fascinating, all the different East Asian and Asian pedagogy, uh, systems of theater and systems of performance, but they would also bring in Philip Zarelli and others from across the world. Um, but they were trying to look at it and formalize some kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, pedagogy, which is at a, at a bachelor's level or a master's level of training uh, at this tertiary education level. And Shankar was a, a, a student from there. And later on, I found out that he, I mean, I knew this the whole time, but I realized that he was also an alumni of the Trichur School of Drama. Um, and the Trichur School of Drama, uh, for some reason, had a golden age because I know so many practitioners from there who have gone on to do some amazing things, including running the International uh, Theatre Festival in Kerala, of which Shankar was uh, an artistic director. Um, but uh, the, the story that I want to tell is basically that um, we used to keep coming back and doing these proto prototype drama school courses, which we used to call the intensive drama program. And Shankar would come in with other faculty from across the country. We had uh, Tomba from Kanayal Hal's um, uh, theater center in the Northeast. Uh, we had Ben Samuels who's here, Daniel Goldman who's here. Uh, all of these guys would come and teach. Tushar was one of the first students of the IDP. He now teaches at the Drama School Mumbai 10, 10 years later. Um, and um, everyone would ask me, so what is the pedagogy of the school? What are you trying to do? And I didn't really know. I was just trying to bring best practices from across the world and, and have them converse and see what they could do to the students. And we have this expression, uh, a bhel puri or a pot puri. And, you know, there's no, it's just a, a jumble and a mix up. Does it, what, what, is its, what is its articulation? And I struggled with this for a long time. Uh, I, I was just winging it, to be honest, at the beginning. Sorry to shy. Um, but... Um, there was this yaha moment that happened when Ben Samuels came in for the fourth intensive drama program. And he said, let's get them to do uh, something akin to the Lecoq Autoco. And I was sitting there with Shankar, um, who trained at TTRP and uh, uh, at Trichur School of Drama and had his own experiences. I was sitting there with uh, Tomba, who came from a completely indig indigenous and self-created uh, theater form and practice. Uh, I was sitting there with Preeti Atreya, who was a dancer who, who studied under Padmini Chetur. And I was sitting there with Ben Samuels, who came from the Lecoq Lispa uh, pedagogy. And when we were looking at the students and watching their tasks, I found that we were all speaking different languages in our feedback. But we were all looking for the same things. We were looking for these universal like the, the, the connection, the believability, the moment of truth in performance, the connection with the breath, the body, the voice, the, 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 the transcendent of that moment. Um, and it was, that's what sort of really gave me the confidence to say, you know what, we can start a drama school and we will just look at it and we will, we will build, build our pedagogy based on these universal truths of, of performance. 
but that's just one layer and i'm just going to cover uh, uh, um, bracket this because shankar and i just decided we wouldn't separate pedagogy with practice or with creation because performance and training for performance is one layer but we're, we're, we're trying to create theater makers to create things and uh, then what they create and who they create for etc that also has to come in there and what is the message what is the story being told and are there universal truths in that or not and this is kind of where the, the departure point and the stimuli of why i asked shankar to come in here as part of my quest is because i'm actually looking to see um, if we were to have some kind of a planetary drama school or you know not just for teaching you how to be a theater maker or how to be a performer but how to how to how to create and be a storyteller um, then what happens uh, when you're working across cultures and across the planet and in across spaces because uh, we know how local things can be and we know the problems of globalization for example and i'm using that as an example and who better than to take us on this because uh, shankar has created amazing pieces of work he has worked with japanese performers he has worked uh, uh, in europe he's uh, you can see his uh, his cv there uh, he has looked at the intercultural process in multiple ways as a creator and so if we can look at theater practice as the continuum of the whole thing and then have a conversation would be great and the way this is works is shankar is going to uh, have some opening remarks but as you hear him and as you think about these things that i'm questing on uh, and uh, just feel free to to throw in um, uh, throw in your questions uh, right off the get go because i'm going to open this out as soon as possible to become a a conversation versus uh, some very sort of formal moderated thing because shankar and i are both interested in the vibrant group of people in this room and the fact that we can all really have a a mind expanding conversation together so shankar without further ado thank you it hey, thanks thanks jihan thanks for uh, uh many things so uh, i have completely lost my plan uh, of how i wanted to proceed because no. <laughs> because i see i i see kavita srinivasan uh, is the same kavita srinivasan uh, whom i met uh, in uh, in jihan's workshops and whom i collaborated in several productions and uh, who eventually uh, was the architect of my theater so <laughs> you know uh, kavita uh, you know i met kavita with jihan and uh, she is an mit trained architect who had an acting bug and a love for theater so uh, and like you know that collaboration you know it ended up in building this you know theater space a theater dwelling in attapadi so uh, that's you see it's my plan is completely gone <laughs> you have to show up kavita you have to show your face and hi, hi. Uh, sorry, sorry, co comment my, back hi hi my internet is not very good here so i missed some of that but i heard utter party and architect so i think you're referring to me <laughs> yes exactly yeah hi good to see you it's good to see you i see a lot of a lot of old faces and old friends of shankar have shown up which is beautiful so shankar daniel and ben and Let's start. Yeah. Let's start. Come, oh. come back. So, so I I throw a question at you, and I and I and I and and I know for me also this is exciting, Shankar, because we haven't worked together for years, maybe like six or seven years at least. Um, and mm -hmm. as we loop back, you've been on such a journey which has taken you to new realizations, and I think that that's where my question of like in all of the intercultural practice, and I'm kind of thinking about the last uh, sentence in your bio. which is that your your itfok work was also there and i think moenia and gani will find this interesting was also there to challenge eurocentric notions and to look at more of a south south paradigm in terms of how we curate and make work and produce so um go ahead shankar ah uh, so I, 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 let me start with this uh, uh, one performer uh, who i came across in japan uh his name is uh, takuso kubikukuri uh i'll start with his story and then i'll go into a small opening sort of statement which again came from japan which provoked me uh, so uh, takuso kubikukuri is a person is an artist is a performance artist and uh, almost all his life what he's been doing is hanging himself so that is his action that's what he called so he lives in this uh a dilapidated hut in a very posh residential area in tokyo 
and uh, uh, he has a backyard which he calls a small a three meters by four meters backyard which he calls the Niva Gekijo garden theater and there is a tree there and every day whether it is raining whether it is snowing he would hang himself uh, he would hang himself maybe three times, four times a day, whether there are people to watch him or not. He just continued doing his this action for over 40 years. And uh, every month uh, for a week or so, he would open his theater to the public. You could like 10 people could squeeze and watch uh, him come out of the house, approach the noose. Uh, he steps on an anvil. The anvil is very significant for him. Uh, and then he holds the noose, he uh, puts it around his neck, supported by the jaw. So it's not like really strangling him, but he's holding all his weight on his jaw. And he would hang, he would just you know, hang himself and oscillate like a pendulum for say five minutes. And then the body comes to a standstill. And, you know, it's very peaceful and quiet to watch it. Like, you know, it, it, it sounds like, you know, horrible, but it's very peaceful, quiet. Uh, uh, the gaze that he has is extraordinary. Uh, he looks at a thing only once. So his focus, the way he shifts his focus, beautiful from a grain of a sand to uh, stems of plants, to uh, leaves of trees, to clouds, to the, to far away. Like, you know, he would even stare at the, afternoon sun and uh, you know such incredible passion in doing what he's doing and he does this only this every day and uh, the body comes to a standstill then slowly you know he starts a dance like he 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 raises his feet as if he's about to take a step as if he's going to walk the air uh, he unbuttons a shirt uh, his shirt one or two buttons you know gyrates uh, subtly with his hip holds himself you know with the hands on the noose and he sort of takes off his neck from this and releases the grip in his hand so he jumps he bounces a couple of times in the small pit that he has dug and this for him he thinks that this is uh, that's how the astronauts would have felt like when they come back and face gravity so that is always a big moment for him, like, you know, how the moment he meets the earth and he would normally walk out of the pit and make eye contact with the people who are watching him, invite them home. He would have cooked food for them. He would have had drinks for them and they would eat and talk. And, and this is what he kept doing. So uh, I'm, why I'm talking about him is he's very close to me and uh, he passed away in 2000. 18 and uh, he sleeps in this theater now and we have made a replica of the garden theater adjacent to his Niva, uh, his theater adjacent to our theater and uh, him and his partner uh, who is also a choreographer they are both here so there is there are some values in his performance that I find very interesting which was recently articulated though not in relation to his performance but by a japanese economist his name is mizu mizuno kazuo so uh, uh, this recently there was this one seminar uh, webinar uh, where you know he was talking in relation to performing arts and uh, i found uh, his uh, articulation uh, striking very striking so uh, uh, this is how he puts it, you know, theater, performing arts, dance, etc., which are routinely considered as non-productive and uh, not so useful, may actually uh, prove itself to be, prove themselves to be extremely useful during this post-pandemic times, during these times. So he makes this comparison between the pre-pandemic world uh, 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 the production, the post-pandemic sort of the crisis. And uh, he critiques this idea of faster, farther, uh, and, you know, more productive, uh, you know, the rational way of production. So, and, and he thinks this is actually, this has come to a standstill, or this is what the pandemic has sort of completely challenged. And instead of this kind of faster, farther, and, uh, and a more, a uh, rational way of working. He proposes the diametrically opposite way of thinking, which is slower, closer, and a more tolerant approach. 
So uh, this, this I think is very important, the slower, closer, and the more tolerant way to, to look at things. And he thinks theater and performing arts has the, uh, can adapt to this slower, closer, more tolerant way, much easier than other formats or mediums. So I, I think that is these three key, these three remain as keywords. Like he, he gave this uh, talk sometime early during the pandemic, but you know, even for, for me, even now these three words hold, you know, they are very resonant. And, and I, I really am struck by the way he uses comparative degree in language. So it is not close or it is not closest, it's closer and slower. And uh, this, I think, in many ways, I think for our, for me, I think uh, for a way to work in a, in this new circumstance is to embrace these ideals. And Hangman, you know, he had sort of embraced these ideals in the way he produced and created his work uh, or his life. You know, very synonymous for him. Art and life are very synonymous. He did not make any distinction between his life and art. He would do it whether people are watching, whether people are not watching, whether there is, you know, whether it makes money or doesn't make money, that action continues. And I think that that kind of makes me, you know, helps me to find a way forward in these times. So that's it, guys. This is sort of my opening statement. <laughs> Jehan, let's discuss. Great. Um, yeah, so really, I'm, I'm, I'm just, that's the opening statement. And if you're already provoked, you can start by just getting off mic and saying, I have a question or I have a thought and a response to that. Uh, and go ahead and don't uh, hesitate. Otherwise, I can always dig deeper a little bit with Shankar. Um, but uh, just uh, whilst you guys uh, um, put your thoughts together on this, maybe, um, because it's hard to always go first. Um, Tushar, I did say I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, but I mean, like, you're hearing Shankar, you've also trained under him. Uh, you've also been on your own interesting journey um, where you, uh, after the IDP, the first year of the DSM, which were all prototype formulations of something here, then you went to Bell Art School in California. So, so how, how is, just tell us how it's making, how is what Shankar is saying resonating with you? And um, yeah, to start with, because aren't we all, I mean, for me, the, the, the question that I'm coming back to is, is, aren't we all so hybrid internally in ourselves in terms of all the experiences we have? I mean, Shankar, you studied at TTRP, you, you, everything you do is, is, is a sum total of all the experiences you've had in the past, which have been a, a very rich potpourri of experiences from across cultures. Similarly, Tushar is on a similar journey. I think we all have that in us, not just as artists, but as as, as people in life with privilege, I guess. Um, so, uh, Tushar, yeah. thoughts? Or... Uh, yeah, uh, it's really great listening to Shankar talk, as always. Uh, and I remember uh, visiting him in September 19 and him talking about uh, Takuzo. And again, like being really uh, drawn by this idea of slowness of gaze, uh, of art and life kind of merging. Uh, Shankar did the IDP with, uh, I was a part of that IDP in 2011. Daniel was there as well uh, and a few others. Mm -hmm. And I remember at that time, uh, Shankar and Prabhat, uh, who also really been a great teacher for me, have were kind of extremely strict in their perspective on uh, performing arts. There was a real kind of, and if I lack of a better word, rigidity to it, uh, which I kind of took with me and was like, mm, uh, really kind of uh, that, that action what I'm doing right now. Uh, and then uh, years later, when uh, Shankar came back for the uh, drama school Mumbai and Archana, one of our, my ensemble members is here as well. I was kind of preparing all my classmates being like, you know, Shankar's really strict and you know, he's going to come in and you know, lay down the law and he's going to really work us and we ended up encountering a totally different person. <laughs> and everyone's looking at me like, wait, what were you talking about? Uh, and then just like this, this idea of a perspective or a way of being that's constantly evolving. Uh, and so then I kind of, you know, went out to California and then like exposed to again, different ways of being and different ways of teaching 
that again talks a lot to what Shankar just mentioned, slower, closer, more tolerant, uh, which kind of went, you know, a little contrary to my first exp exposures to physical theater, especially. Uh, and then coming back and meeting Shankar again in 19 uh, at his play at the at his theater, and again seeing someone who had been is now in a different place than where I saw him 2014, uh, and that kind of just like uh, reinforcing my sense that uh, we are constantly kind of shifting in our uh, perspective and our uh, beings and our you know uh, ways of engaging with this work uh, and that gives me a weird sense of hope in some way uh, like almost like I don't have to get there right now that what is happening in this moment is very likely going to change or evolve uh, in a few days time uh, so yeah just uh, again as I hear Takuzo's story and I've heard this a few times now and always being kind of struck by uh, just the significance, especially nowadays, when we are kind of uh, been forced in some ways to be slow uh, and to kind of uh, look a little bit more. Yeah. There's a there's a feeling, Shankar, between the first and second wave of the pandemic, um, that when we saw the world trying to get uh, kickstarted back to normal. And there was a moment where I felt like there's a tragic loss of opportunity here. Here is this great chance to hit this global reset switch. You know, I mean, that was the, the idealistic, optimistic thinking. But, you know, you're, you're currently in Atapadi. You've turned to beekeeping right now. Um, and, uh, you're, and you should uh, share a little bit more context of the space you're currently in and what you're doing. But how do you, what do you think the, do you think there is a reset switch or a, or a, or a metaphorical reset switch uh, from which maybe we can start implementing or taking um, um, uh, Mizuno Kazuo's uh, advice and sort of bringing it out to the world? Because this idea, so what I really liked about uh, both the hangman story and everything you said beyond that is that moment of meeting the ground again, almost rediscovering that you are part of this planet. You know, you've, you've taken yourself to that near point of death and then you go to that stillness and then you jump down and you, it's almost a rejoicement and a celebration again, right? Mm -hmm. And so that rediscovery of the new moment of reappreciation, um, that's one. And, and the idea that this was not, it was his action and his action wasn't art or life, it was him. It was just his action, art and life are the same. How do we get, I, I don't know. So, so is there an opportunity here that we can, learn from this or think from this about how to take everyone on this journey with us? Is this an understanding that only you and me and theater makers and other people who are fortunate enough to have this in their lives get to think about and do? Or can we actually, uh, uh, you know, back up uh, Mr. Kazuo, the Japanese economist, and actually give him the means with which to get us as a society or as societies over there? What do you, what have you been thinking about what, What's next for you, for theater, for the world? Do you care? <laughs> <laughs> I think, again, Kavita Srinivasan again in the screen makes me think architecture is the answer. There is something in architecture, you know, to, to look for. Like, you know, we have to change the architecture of our lives. You know, we have to change the architectures of our theaters. You know, there are so many things that, you know, you know has to, you know, I think you know, we have to rethink. Uh, I see. Uh, I was listening to Rustam Rustam Barucha's uh, this uh, nine-part speech act series, which was uh, published, and uh, he talks about uh, like a Spanish flu plague and historical, you know, the history of pandemic and theater, and never, never has you know theaters agreed or succumbed to these kind of regulations to close down during pandemics. Like, like uh, the players would play underground, audience would come watch underground, theaters kept going. So like what we saw this year was phenomenal the last year, like when the state says, shut down your theaters, like we did, you know, close down, we closed out theaters. So uh, uh, I think why, I, I, we must ask the question why, why there was no resistance from anywhere in the world for theaters to run. 
uh, we tried, like, you know, because again, coming back to uh, Kavita's architecture of our theater, she follows principles of open theater architecture, which means we can ventilate our theater fully. And, you know, she has an amphitheater design where, you know, you can socially distance and you can be watching theater. So what stops us from doing that? Why are we so sort of scared? Like, and why do we, why are we so obedient with the state? And look at the way they are sort of uh, taking us, you know, it's a dead end. It's like, you know, he is, he is the Pied Piper, you know, sitting there and taking us all into this dead ends. I think, you know, somewhere, you know, they must find ways to break these frames, come out and, you know, find ways to, you know, manifest, you know, this kind of resistance. So that's, I think, that, that is the re reset buttons. These are the, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't give an answer because it's too big. I'll push you on that a little bit. And then guys do, Daniel, are you putting your hand up? Oh, can you get off mic? I mean, what, so, hey, Shankar, so nice to Hi, see you. Hi, Daniel. It's so good to see you, Daniel. So we're in a funny, we're, theaters are just opening here. Where they've opened, they opened on seventeenth of May. They're opening with social distancing. All through the pandemic, there was this sense, this hope that theatre would come back, different, reset, something would change. That's not what we're seeing at the moment. We're seeing a scrabble for as much. We're seeing much smaller shows. We're talking about the UK, a very specific example. We're seeing lots of smaller shows, but this scrabble, this everyone's get trying to get back into that super fast rhythm. And all through the pandemic, everyone was going, ah, oh, it's so good to have time to think and to slow down and to some of the words that you were you were saying. But there's this sense that the one word in the UK, and I think that it's it, it's a dangerous word, but the word that we've been using a lot is a kinder theater. And this sense of kindness is a very strange, obviously we want it to be kinder. We want our theaters to be more accessible. We want the way that we treat each other to be better. But there's something about this word kinder that I don't know, it, it, there's, there's something that doesn't work about it there's something that it allows though that it allows the privilege in some way to to sort of mm. to be exacerbated mm. it, there's a there's a sort of hierarchy to the word kinder who gets to be kind to who <laughs> but they're just there's something about this we've not talked about well everyone talked about slower and closer that seems to already have gone like we've missed our opportunity already for <laughs> and it's gone the focus is on kind and there's obviously lots of examples you know there's an amazing organization that's just opened up 20,000 square meters of free rehearsal space in the center of London free for everyone to use that's an incredible resource that's fine I'm all for it great but there's just I this sense of reset, this slowness, it feels like now that the opportunity is here, we're all scrabbling at 100 miles an hour to get back. And there's a lot of fear. That's the thing that nobody, re there's a lot of fear and people aren't ready to go back. And the lessons learned through the pandemic are still, you know, we talk in Lecoq terms about memory in the body. The body's been quiet for 15 months and yet our heads, are going in 100 miles an hour to get back. All thoughts based on what you were saying. I don't know if anybody feels the same or has, yeah, just wanted to share those thoughts. Thank you, so, Daniel. So Shankar, thank you, Daniel. Um, I think that, that I was that kinder and that, that, that feeling of whether it rings absolutely true or not in, in the context that he described is absolutely, it's there, it's how do we be genuine about this stuff? Um, so I think I've approached the question with you wrong, Shankar, is like, I, you know me, I like to think in terms of grand scale and like, how do, we, how do we maximize this? How do we make sure everybody on the planet does this? And I think like that crazy, you know, I think I have it in my genes 
<laughs> but uh, but let me let me reverse it. Let me flip it. Actually, go back to this. You're talking about where where are, where are we? Why did we not resist the state? Why did we not? Uh, why did we take it so lying down, etc.? But then maybe there's a, a question about. Uh, let's not look at where it lives in the polit in the politic or the body of the the body politic, but where it lives in our individual bodies. Because Daniel alluded to it as well. What do you think from everything that you've done, or where do you think do you think that there's something to be explored? about first answering that question at, at within yourself and within the performers you work with and or working with the performers you work with to to answer that question um the same question like why why did, why did we let the theater shut down why did we shut down ourselves why did we acquiesce to all of this i'm just trying to link it all the way back so that even our practice becomes slower and closer so Sorry, I realized why I was talking about kindness. The theaters in this country shut down because it was kinder not to put people at risk. It was all about everyone else. We have to shut ourselves down and theaters will continue doing social distancing for the next year because of this sense of a theater and the left as the guardians of kindness and kindness meaning taking even more care Anyway, that, okay. I remember that was my point, one of my points. Mm. Mm. Actually, Amy, I think you're trying to ask the question I'm trying to ask, but you've, you've, you've got it better. Do you want to go off mic and, and take your comment? Because I think it actually takes us in the same direction. Well, it just, um, uh, it, yeah, and Mumgeni has, has chimed in with something I think really is, is also in the same line of things. It's, it's sort of unique opportunity. Uh, you know, I, I I looked quickly at the at the video link uh, to the Hangman. It's fascinating, and it, and and it just seems so to be so much about um, you know his pers his unique expression. And then uh, there's the um, uh, Erdem Gunduz who who started the silent protests in in Istanbul. It, it was the chance that they had uniquely to sort of manifest. It meant something to stand still. Uh, it, it, meant, it meant something. It wouldn't maybe mean the same thing if I stood still uh, in downtown Hobart. Um, it's a sort of, there's a unique positionality depending on our identity and our location. And it has a lot to do with our intersection with this sort of late capitalist. I mean, if I stood, I, I just, I've imagined uh, moving terribly slowly at Canary Wharf and I'm quite sure that I'd be arrested. You know, it just, it would just, it would stand out if I were to move very, very slowly in a commercial area. So there's something about, uniqueness, the uniqueness of the position and the uni uniqueness of the location, but the awareness could be more universal. If we were all aware that we have these unique possibilities to manifest this, as you're saying, slow, um, tolerant, and, and, uh, and you know, I, I don't know about the word kind. Uh, it's a bit of a trap, that word. Many? I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, hello, sorry. I'm thinking along some of the lines to, to Amy there. Um, I, I cannot for the life of me remember whether his name is Tim Robbins, um, who talks about slow activism. Um, but again, this, this, this idea that the world has become so structured by this continual acceleration towards, you know, particular destinations, towards specific goals. Um, everything is kind of quantified in terms of, productive time and productive time that's framed in a kind of Fordian kind of logic, right? If you're not expending time to produce something that is quantifiable and perhaps is even um, sellable, right? Something that, that, that produces value that is transferable to other people, it's fungible. Um, that we, we, there is something in enforcing a practice or an ethics of deceleration because it, it reclaims, it allows us to reclaim ownership of how we expend time um, and to kind of formulate ways of expending time in ways that perhaps lift us out of that kind of accelerated kind of late capitalist logic um, to perhaps produce different modes of relation to the world. Um, and, and the way that it does that is by forcing us to attend closely to the moment. Um, it's similar to, I think, what Mark who joined us last week talks about as Brennan is, and, and I think it also connects to the, the example of the, the ruin in the landscape that he was talking about, is that you can either move past it or you sit with it, right? 
but it, it's all connects to this idea of, of sitting in rather than kind of glancing through or, or speeding through to another destination. Um, yeah, there's something I find very exciting about the practice of slowness. And also on another thought, I'm thinking about because Japan specifically of Buto and that kind of aesthetic that came out of a similar kind of cultural moment of crisis and re-engagement in the 20s, right? And, and also responding to a, a radically shifting kind of cultural landscape that had to reckon with these, these major shifts in, in how um, people were, were kind of living and occupying space. Um, yeah, very poorly formed, but there are, there are these kind of little hooks that, that are taking me elsewhere in really interesting ways. Hi. Hi, Shankar. Hi, Jehan. Um, hi, Shankar. I had a question for you, or like a thought or a comment. I'll see what it turns out to be. Um, and this was about this nature of showing or displaying or performing and the value of that. And so when you were telling us the hangman story, there was um, a certain kind of value that uh, came across in the way you said it about him doing this action, whether or not people were watching. Um, and that was somehow like elevated a little bit from how you said it. Um, and on the other side, when you speak about resistance and political uh, action, uh, there needs to be a visibility to that or a kind of um, a public nature to that. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on um, invisible resistance. Is it not valuable or what, is, what does that even look like? What is it like? Um, what makes uh, art or performance performance when it is not being witnessed? And what are the kind of parallels that you see or draw between visibility and impact and legitimacy to an act, whether it's resistance or performance, and um, the invisibility of that, or like when it's not visible, then does it count? So it is a question, I suppose. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, my just thoughts, uh, I'm thinking like your question as well as the comments earlier sort of ties up to one thing like this, countering the logic of capitalism. I think how, like we are asking that, I think we are like trying to find ways to counter this logic of capitalism. So uh, again, going back to Hangman, what is so profound uh, in him is he embraces poverty. So uh, whereby he, he is able to counter it invisibly, as you just said, like it's not a protest as he goes out in the street and, you know, it's not something that needs to be made visible for him. But for him, he lives in this very small shack, uh, dilapidated, rundown hut. And, you know, uh, to meet his ends, I think he works in a construction site. He goes to work in a construction site, just enough to make money. And, you know, for his theater, it's a donation. Like, if you want, you can, like, put a thousand yen or, like, you know, you can put less. You can you can still go and watch him. So, uh, and with that, this, this, the very fundamental idea that they come together after that, closely around the table, sit talk, uh, you know, th these are all, I think, manifestations of those resistance. Like, if you look at the life in Japan, like, you know, this is how resistance manifests. Like, you know, you live in poverty in the middle of skyscrapers, you have a shack and your neighbors are like, you know, trying to get you out somehow because, you know, it's weird. Like when I wake up and I look out of my window, I see a man hanging, you know, so that is it. <laughs> This keeps going on and on and on and people don't know what he's doing. And uh, uh, it's, uh, but I think like, you know, for him, that position that he takes is, and it's difficult because, you know, that is again, why that metaphor of that anvil is very strong 
there because you have to sort of you know uh, uh, temper yourself like an anvil to be able to face this world because an anvil is something which gets the most hammered in the blacksmith's you know a uh, 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 shed like it's you know red hot iron is placed on it hammered back and forth and then the and then the tools keep changing but the anvil remains the same so <laughs> you know there are some kind of you know cryptic metaphoric sort of ideas that one can draw from again going back to takuzo and his like poor life in 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 and he was happy he was not never complained about like you know like he didn't want to be wealthy he didn't want to be part of the system he wanted to be by himself uh, uh, he was a dropout and like if i have some notes on his career and i can share it with you later when i have i can type it out like he started as a boxer and uh, it didn't work out like you know of course like as a frail young man like you know and then then like you know he would you know bury himself down in this performance artist again like you know the time in japan was very sort of confused like socially politically historically this kind of uh, it, it it must have been a uh, like you know people uh, capital going one side like you know development and growth and like where people are also like getting eliminated so he stood there like you know he stood there he stood his ground all his life and i think he made a statement in that sense thank you for that i'm i'm actually just you we were talking about this in a pre talk earlier shankar but how this pandemic moment is sort of taking us to the ultimate uh, experience of isolated practice or isolated existence right mm -hmm. uh, we're all locked up in our rooms in our homes and this seems to be almost a manifestation of i mean i don't know is it the politics of be, isolation the politics of isolation Perform, the politics performing of, in our bodies yeah and so that's there and i'm like just is there is there something i'm i'm looking for this seed or this moment of genesis where where do we get to see the the phoenix arise from the ashes is is there such a thing uh, a response to the logic of capitalism that can now take over in this moment of reset is this the moment where we're hanging all still and waiting to jump off the noose uh, i'm using it as a metaphor because it's available to me right now but you know i think you know what i mean and i'm just again at the individual level what how, how do we process this moment and as theater makers as as theater practitioners as people teaching other people to now enter into theater practice so that they can go on to make art live life be art plus life as one um what are we doing what should we be doing and that's my question but we'll come back to that because i have and come back to that that's a question for everybody in this room by the way not just shankar i'm not putting him on the spot anymore because we're past half past the hour uh let's go let's uh let's go is that i hope i pronounced that right please do come on uh and uh share all oh, your questions um, uh thanks johan it's lesego um i'm lesego what i'm about to say is very poorly formed but um play with me for 5 seconds i'm very very <sighs> challenged and compelled by this idea of going against the capitalist logic the capitalist sen sensibility i suppose because i think it is a a sensibility in in many ways um and i think it's a sensibility that tends towards producing it tends towards action and acting right um and i think that this idea about the pandemic moment slowing everything down I, I struggle to see that as a reality um because i think it just accelerated reaction i think we've all particularly as as performance makers and as um um industry people we have all reacted and we have reacted very quickly so the slowing down i i don't see happening um i i'm thinking about I'm thinking about all of the material all of the kind of digital space stuff that's like embrace the moment and let's let's make let's not stop making let's keep making you know and that mm. feels like the height of capitalist sensibility is let's make let's just produce let's react you know this thing is happening so let's go 
Um, so I don't know. I think um, rhetorically and and maybe um, metaphorically, there there is a, a, a romantic desire to slow down. But because life is this capitalist model, it is um, it is impossible. And so we haven't achieved it, and we haven't even um, marinated on on our inability to to achieve it. I think. Um, I don't know if there's a question in there or if I'm done. I think I'm going to go with done. Can I just jump in very quickly uh, off the yes, back yes. of this? It's just to, you know, it's, um, it's a really interesting uh, reframing that you just put on the table. And I feel like one of the other things that has been accelerated is, uh, is the awareness of disparity globally. I mean, the, the awareness of it, not the fact of it, obviously, but that feels like has been um, accelerated, heightened, pushed to the forefront to some degree. Um, yeah. That's my half thought. Come back with the rest of it just now. Can but I you also you, Yeah, sure. I would also propose that certainly there's, there seems to be a heightened awareness of those things, but also there's a heightened fantasy of participation in addressing those things too, that I feel has increased more recently because we're forced to engage in the online. So I think people are performing their proximity to those sorts of struggles in very different ways um, than we were a year ago even. Um, that, that the fantasy of participating is interesting to me there as well, right? I, I can kind of present myself in a particular way, but I'm still kind of, you know, I'm not required to put my body on the line in the same sorts of ways. So I think I, I, I might tend towards a more spectacular performance of, of, of whatever my politics might be than we might have done in other times. So it's both an awareness, but also perhaps an increasing inability to react functionally to what those differences mean. I, I find myself thinking, um, First of all, uh, let's go. I think uh, less, less hope. Sorry, I need a little help with that. Again, uh, less hope. Is that correct? Uh, yes, yes, that's all good. Right. That's good. Okay. Thank so you. I think I think what you said is right. I, I don't think it's. I think it oversimplifies, or it, it 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 actually takes us away from the problem to look at all of this as a response to capitalism. Um, and I, I totally agree with that. And I'm just looking at Moenia's provocation to me in the chat, which is, you know, you're looking at the phoenix and the spectacular moment in terms of finding all your answers, but maybe the trick is to stay with the stillness, uh, which is something my therapist has also been saying to me. Uh, <laughs> which is, pause, stay, you don't need to get out there and fix the world. But what is actually happening, and I, was on, uh, I just discovered Clubhouse yesterday, for the first time, this horrible, evil, horrible thing, uh, very addictive. But um, more than that, um, going off um, Genny's point, I just wanna, this, this heightened fantasy of part participation implied in that is our act of performance. And somewhere I almost feel like now that we're in this space, in this digital space where we're completely um, performing our lives in many ways to the public uh, or to different forums, uh, the idea of conflating performer and life, art and performance and actual life into one thing uh, suddenly becomes very real and suddenly everyone, everyone is doing it. So maybe we should be embracing the fact that there is already all of us in all these Zoom rooms all over the world or whatever, or in Clubhouse or wherever, that we're all performing. We're all performing our lives. We're all sharing our lives. We're all manifesting expressions or being silent uh, to just incorporate and take on Shabri's point as well. Uh, it's, there's, there's something internal going on over there as well. So I'm just wondering if that's where the opportunity is to, sorry, I, I'm, I'm pre uh, DNA adjusted to try and look for what is the next move. And I guess what I'm learning from this conversation, I'll shut up here and leave it to you guys, but is, is do I need to even be asking that question? Um, because 
I'm faced what Manya has just written. Uh, the master, wait, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. <laughs> Thank you, Shankar. <laughs> yes. Um, Manya, what you have said is, is exactly what's happening uh, with me, uh, within myself. So I am almost like reflecting exactly what my students are going through because I want to get on and fix. But uh, I think, yeah, Moenia, you, you have to get on and then Shankar, you have to respond to, to, to whatever comes next. And anyone else, please raise your hands or just go off mic if you have to just literally pop in and say something. Moenia, all yours. I've, I mean, I'm just gonna say what I've written. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking about thinking about teaching and thinking about the students that I saw yesterday and that I'm gonna see later and that I'll see tomorrow and having such, I mean, that's why I'm so compelled by these conversations because I feel like as an individual educator in this wild, insane time, my desire and my intention is so for something that is slower. I just wanna stop the goddamn machine. The machinery of the institution is maddening it always has been and I just want to like put a brick through every window I realize this is being recorded um so 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 um so there's that so I feel you know up against I'm also teaching fourth year students who are graduate graduating students and they have such anxiety about what is going to happen <laughs> with them and these crazy degrees that they have persuaded their parents to spend exorbitant amounts of money to pay for. Um, so it feels, uh, you know, it feels really tiring to, to try and practice a level of kind of self-protection, you know, for all of the kind of onslaught of anxiety and fear. Um, and it's a very useful exercise for me, I have to say. Um, but it's, uh, I feel so tuned into the fact that um, my, what I want for myself and for them with all of these incredible skills and techniques that they have that they will leave with is, is, is a, is a headspace that allows them to just keep those wolves at bay, you know, keep the producing wolves at arm's length. Um, and I wonder, there's, there's, there's a big gap between this desire of mine uh, for myself and for them and what I'm actually able to make happen. But I do, you know, my kind of a hyper awareness of it does make, I, I'm feeling like a much more responsive as in responding to what is happening in the room educator than I have been before. So it's tiring, but it's a really interesting kind of, you know, we're, we're gonna go with, we're gonna go with what is in the room today for real, for real. Um, and sometimes we have to do that in a very practical level because, you know, five students have had COVID scares and, you know, all of that requires such wild uh, adaptive kind of behavior um, that I guess we're primed for in some cases. Um, yeah, that's, that's my riff. That's, that's what's on my mind at the moment. Shankar, you, you know Amy. Uh, Amy, yes, but I'm just going to take, uh, let's listen to Amy, but Shankar, I do want you to, you have a lot of experience with slowness, stillness, still moving. Um, and I don't know, I mean, you've had such an embodied experience of directing pieces like that and, and working in that way um, with your work with Ota Shogo, uh, Water Station, for example. Maybe there's some things you can share from that discovery that would help me, would help our students, would help learning to even ourselves be still like just something uh, thoughts on there but amy did you amy you want to go before that or after that well i, I don't want to be contrarian so why don't why don't uh, why don't you have that discussion first okay and then we'll go to uh, we'll go to you and Liseo, uh, Liseo, i see your hand up so just don't put the hand up just get off mic when you need to get off mic shankar share, 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 do you think do you think there's anything we can we can learn anything you'd like to share with us about that from that time? Mm. <laughs> I, see, I have directed the water station four times and uh, it's a very strict, rigid play with actions precisely sort of scored, but it has always been different, always. And like, you know, early on Tushar said like, 
like when uh, the first time uh, he worked with me, uh, like the second time we worked together, uh, the third time it's different. Like, you know, also like I'm sure for Kavita Srinivasan also, like we have been in other productions and Water Station, she has played it twice. Uh, it's it just that, uh, again, see, uh, when we started Jihan, we started on this pre pretext on the idea of universal truths, the universality, etc., which was also like sort of, you know, at the back of my mind. And you know, I was also seeking that the, as I kept working, it, it, there, is, uh, there is more interest in looking at the differences uh, rather than uh, you know, looking at the universalities, because then there is something very special that will come out of the individual. Like, again, going back to Ziyami, the Japanese uh, uh, Natri Shastra, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the poet, playwright, uh, actor Ziyami, uh, he talks about the foundation of uh, every actor's career is a quality called the yugen, which is like the child, like the child, the child in the child. So uh, he says, like when 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 a, when a child comes on stage, like you know, no matter what he does, he will immediately grab and strike and grab the attention of the audience. Uh, you know, and that is the quality, like that is the quality of the child. That is the foundation for every sort of actor. Uh, in, in the future. So what I, f I found myself wrong in t teaching and training is that like, you know, this kind of rigor and you know, strictness and formal training actually can harm that child in the actor. So that's why I took a step away from teaching theater because I still haven't figured out a way how to do it. Like mm. it's in letting the actor create I think that is where the beauty is rather than telling the actor what to do, how to do, you know, it's, it's not interesting. It's not interesting, but like when an actor, you know, it's like, you know, fully creative, you know, state of mind when they do things like, it's like it, I can watch the same thing thousand times. It doesn't, I, I don't get bored. I think it's, it is in that sort of approach that maybe there is, uh, there is something I, I don't know the answers, Jihan. Really, honestly, Tusha the other day wrote to me about talking to bees. You know, so uh, can you repeat that, Tusha? Because you know, I, I literally I go and talk to my bees. Because what do you? What else do you do in these times? You go sit next to a beehive and talk. Uh, Tell us, Tusha. Shankar, you sitting and talking to your bees is very, very, very hopeful right now. Uh, so in Kentucky, I don't know if it's a world thing. Uh, but my partner lives in Kentucky and she was moving a bunch of bee beehives. Uh, and apparently there's a tradition over there to tell these bees all the major life events. You tell them when someone has died, when someone is born, uh, when someone is broken up, when a marriage happens. So you speak to the bees and tell them all the important events of the land. Uh, and when the beekeeper passes away, you kind of shift the beehive a uh, little bit to face the grave of the beekeeper. So in many ways, the bee, the bees, the land, the beekeepers kind of become one. Uh, and, I, and I know that Shankar and Satoko are working with bees, so I thought it would be <laughs> good information for them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, talk to the bees. Like, I, like, you know, again, going back to the Rustam Baruch's uh, speech act of nine episode, like, you know, he talks about he rancha. That's what farmers in Punjab did when they had the, the pandemic among the cows. They would sit with their cows and, you know, tell stories to them and be with them. And it's, it's absurd. It's like, you know, but maybe that's what makes sense. Like talk to the animals, talk to trees, uh, you know, talk to the bees. And you know, maybe they'll talk back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, was, I was gonna say maybe listening as well sometimes. Listen to yeah. the bees and listen mm. to the trees. It's just so much talking. Yeah. There are a lot of people in this room who have access to farms and the more pastoral nature, natural lives. Uh, Amy, you had a a, 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 a thought. Yes, well it doesn't seem contrarian now. Um because <laughs> I entirely concur with this uh, idea, let the actor create. And um, also what you said, Mwenya, about keeping it real. I mean, if, if the planet is gripped by a nightmare, what if our job is DreamWorks, you know? So I don't see, I don't see it being necessarily contradictory um, to uh, slow down, be with the space, be close to the space, and also 
maybe create from a slightly different place. I mean, to produce sounds like a very conscious activity. When you talk about keeping it real, we're talking about something that comes from something perhaps more unconscious. Can we just uh, unplug uh, and pick that apart a bit more? There's a difference between the need to produce versus a, a, a more in, inherent sort of act of creation that naturally manifests itself. Is that what you? I mean, yeah, production is the, is the strategy of the ego. Whereas um, the, the real, when the real intervenes, which certainly this pandemic is nothing if not a slap from the real, um, then uh, the unconscious is making its presence felt. And, and if we can hold that space, you know, maybe what we're creating will come from a different, a different place, a different register. That is portable for Frank. Oh no, I just, just, just a quick thought, the difference between an intrinsic and extrinsic kind of creation or production. So whether it's whether we're producing out of, uh, out of an intrinsic need or drive to produce a create work or whether it's imposed and within the within that kind of university system, it's very much imposed, isn't it? Constantly having to make stuff to meet targets or various kind of assessment processes. Um, I mean, I feel I just left uh, lost, lost my, lost my job. One of the people lost their job in the pandemic, and um, that's something I've, I'm really relieved of now. Is, is the pressure for the last thirty years to produce to order? So the decisions I'm making are not are not coming from a drive to say something, but but a drive to meet a, a target and keep my family fed and housed and closed. Mm. Um, so just just thinking about about that for a second. Um, and that's from a very, I mean, I'm aware that's from a very privileged uh, position, having time to not have a job and think. Um, just to sh come in here quickly and share one of the things that I think inspired by these conversations, uh, a move that I have made unbeknownst to my so-called superiors is to stop giving fourth years uh, feedback. Um, I, coordinate, uh, I coordinate a lovely group of staff and you know we're all responsible for supposedly teaching something called acting. And we've decided that, um, yeah, we're gonna stop, that it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense to, to maintain a kind of um, sense in them that uh, their, their understanding of what they're doing will be validated from the outside. So it's all in practice and, you know, check in like at the end of the year, let you know if it's actually worked or not. Um, but we're trying to rather just encourage lots of debriefs and reflections and, a, a, and a, a, an inbuilt ability to, for the students to be able to track their own progress and articulate what that is. And um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting journey so far. And I was thinking about it while somebody else was speaking and it, it seemed to make sense at the time, but it might just be a tangent at this point, but um, yeah, that's it. Maybe it's part of the stillness, the stillness, slowness thing, you know, and part of the kind of, you know, the machinery of the institution among the among the requirements from the educators' point of view is to make marks, make marks happen, and be able to prove that those marks have been arrived at, you know, in some kind of systematic way, particularly if they're challenged, you know, that shit. Um, so I suppose it's a kind of small attempt to work against that um, that uh, particular piece of the machine. Can I just bring in a thought on following on from that and many of the um, ponderings about stillness, kindness, production, the urge or the need to produce industry, all of this, these thoughts and the pandemic. And one of the kind of qualities that I've has been emerging for me over the last year has been distractedness, which isn't usually thought of as a quality. Um, when we think about theater audiences and certainly not actors, and um, we often think about focus. Um, but I've, 
I've come to appreciate the how here we are on Zoom across the world in our Zoom meetings, our teaching on Zoom, um, and so on, per, trying to see if we can perform and that the pressure to produce, as others have mentioned, or it's sort of supposed only other binary option uh, to do nothing and to waste your time, or form to 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 seek stillness and enough reflection well is, can't we have all of that at the same time and the reality of being online sometimes is that we've got our work we've got our real lives if we're educating kids at home or you've got leisure entertainment education it's, it's all in the same place here uh it might, might be on multiple devices but it's all on here and we're sort of sharing it but of course you know i i, I can just be on on this at the same time and 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 half listening and then I come back in and there's something I, I find that comforting and I, I want that I don't want to be forced like Daniel we was maybe it's a UK thing here in the UK as well being forced back into a theater to be a spectator where I must watch this performance or as an mm. actor where I must focus and deliver as as rehearsed and there's something kinder about being able to wander off and come back and think oh I want to watch that or you know rewind and I want to see that bit again and, and there's something of the old, let's call it the carnivalesque, perhaps, where, you know, here we are over four days or whatever, you know, the festival lasts and we can come in and out and just watch the funny bits or just what, you know, go to sleep or, you know, and there's that, that's a kind of kindness. I don't know what that translates into in actual theatre practices now we're coming out, but it's certainly, you know, a way to, to bring together um, and not to be sort of battling between capitalist production and enforced retirement uh, or sabbatical then you mentioned yes Shabri um as someone who's actually tried working with uh, stillness quite a lot and slowness I think all of us at some point have you know, romanticize this idea of slowness and stillness. And who hasn't wanted to kind of slow their lives down? Like who hasn't thought that that's, yeah, you know, that's a good idea. I should do some meditation. I'll download an app on my phone or, you know, whatever. Like which one of us hasn't done it? And yet here we are again, talking about all of this wonderful stuff that comes out of stillness. But if, you, if you've actually done it, uh it's 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 not always fun it's not nice it's not a pleasant feeling always it's quite uh sometimes it's a bit difficult um yeah sometimes it feels really kind of uh rigid and hard and you need to kind of like shake yourself out of stillness and slowness because it's like really kind of uh claustrophobic um, so it's not always like, oh, you know, uh, I'm going to be this amazing, I'm going to have this halo around my head after I've, you know, been still and slow for a while. So I see these two things, like, I often feel like it's the people who've not done it, but have this feeling like, oh, it's something I should be doing, like eating healthy or, you know, going to the gym or doing, you know, 40 push-ups a day or whatever, like, it's one of those things like I should do and everyone says it's really nice and if you look at the chat you'll see like all these amazing references about you know all these people who work <laughs> but yeah honestly it's um not so uh, much fun all the time i'm just gonna put in the chat box again um something that i did with a bunch of students mm. And I think this gives a bit of a kind of a realistic uh, sense of what it feels like, um, at least what it felt like for those guys. And for me, I, I mean, I fully resonate with what they've said. Thanks for that. Um, so we are up to the official ending time. It's 3.40. So another five minutes. So what I will do here 
is I will let us sit quietly and see if we can stand it. <laughs> um, no, I will, <laughs> I will say uh, hi. Uh, thank you to Shankar so much for coming. Thank you guys for being such active participants in the conversation. Uh, we keep the room open traditionally for another 20, 30 minutes. We put off the recording and we literally uh, have the after party and the bit where you sit in the corridor and have your cup of coffee and Shankar and I will uh, light up our cigarettes and chill out and uh, all have a good, uh, and then just have a chat. Um, and so we can spend this time being slower and closer. And I think we're doing okay with the tolerance front. Uh, so, and there's no moderation over here, so you just get off mic and hang out and whoever wants to stay, stay, whoever wants to go, go. Um, just know that uh, all of these chats have been live streamed uh, on uh, HowlRound Theatre Commons, which is a lovely website out of the US. Um, all of these video recordings of the chats are available on the Drama School Mumbai website. And we're talking about now uh, the, whew, about 25, 30 different conversations. Um, and Falguni, who is here, Falguni, you should get off mic and get off screen and, and say hi and wave and let everyone see your face. Uh, she's a recent alumni of the DSM. Before that, she uh, used to be a reporter and a journalist, and she still is, because she has been writing amazing reportage pieces. Um, and I am going to let Amy say thank you, good night, and goodbye to everyone on the formal bit, because before we sign off, Amy is going to tell you what talk we can expect to hear next week, next Thursday. Amy? Thank you. Thank you, Jihan. So um, I would be very gratified if you would attend next week and turn up uh, to participate in a subversive chat, uh, masterless women in teaching physical theater. So uh, it should be a lots of fun and a very controversial, hopefully, and very, very interesting. So please come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And bring anyone who you think will, will, will have their minds sparked by what we're doing and will add refreshing voices and energies to this room. Uh, it's been such a fun room all of these weeks. And I, I leave every Thursday looking forward to the next Thursday. So Shankar, uh, like the first time you did it, uh, this time again, thank you so much for saying yes, let's. <laughs>